in this part 36 of our series of lectures we will continue our discussion regarding trial before a court of session and the section namely section 3 231 which deals with evidence for prosecution where we dealt on the date so fixed the judge shall proceed to set take all such evidence as may be produced in support of the prosecution. The judge may, in his discretion, permit the cross-examination of any witness to be deferred until any other witness or witnesses have been examined or recall any witness for further cross-examination. Now, what is the manner in which a record of the deposition of witness is required to be kept by the court of law with which you are dealt by taking into consideration various sections. Along with this now, if you read right from section 284 up to section 290 of the criminal procedure code, we have a provision of commissions for the examination of witnesses and section 284 says when the attendance of a witness may be dispensed with and commission issued, it says, whenever in the course of any inquiry, trial or other proceeding under this court, it appears to a court or magistrate that the examination of a witness is necessary for the ends of justice and that the attendance of such witness cannot be procured without an amount of delay, expense or inconvenience which under the circumstances of the case would be unreasonable, the court or magistrate may dispense with such attendance and issue, may issue a commission for the examination of the witness in accordance with the provisions of this chapter, namely right from section 272 onwards with which we are dealing, evidence in inquiries and trial. Further it says provided that where the examination of the president or the vice president of India or the governor of a state or the administrator of a union territory as a witness is necessary for the ends of justice, a commission shall be issued for the, examina for the examination of such witness. The court may, when issuing a commission for the, for the examination of a witness for the prosecution, direct that such amount as the court considers reasonable to meet the expenses of the accused including the pleader's fee be paid by the prosecution. Section 285 deals with commission to whom to be issued and it says if the witness is within the territories to which the court extends the commission shall be directed to the chief metropolitan magistrate or Chief Judicial Magistrate as the case may be, within whose local jurisdiction the witness is to be found. If the witness is in India, but in a state or an area to which this court does not extend, the commission shall be directed to such court or officer as the central government may by notification specify in this behalf. If the witness is in a country or a place outside India and arrangements have been made by the central government with the government of such country or place for taking the evidence of a witness in relation to criminal matters, the commission shall be issued in such form directed to such court or officer and sent to such authority for transmission as the central government may by notification prescribed in this behalf. Section 286 says execution of commissions and it reads as follows. Upon a receipt of the commission, the chief metropolitan magistrate or chief judicial magistrate or such metropolitan or judicial magistrate as he may appoint in this behalf shall summon the witness before him or proceed to the place where the witness is and shall take down his evidence in the same manner and may for this purpose exercise the same powers as in trials of warrant cases under this court. Section 2 it may examine witnesses and it says the parties to any proceeding under this court 
in which a commission is issued may respectively forward any interrogatories in writing which the court or magistrate directing the commission may think relevant to the issue and it shall be lawful for the magistrate court or officer to whom the commission is directed or to whom the duty of executing it is delegated to examine the witness upon such interrogatories any such party may appear, appear before such magistrate court or officer by pleader or if not in custody in person and may examine cross examine and re examine as the case may be the said witnesses 288 says written of commission after any commission is issued under section 284 has been duly executed it shall be written together with the depositions of the witness examined there under to the court or magistrate issuing the commissions and the commission the written there to and the deposition shall be open at all reasonable time to inspection of the parties and may subject to all just exceptions be read in evidence in case by either party and shall form part of the record any deposition so taken if it satisfies the condition prescribed by section 33 of the indian evidence act may also be received in evidence at any subsequent stage of the case before another court section 239 says adjournment of proceeding in every case in which a commission is issued under section 284 the inquiry trial or other proceeding may be adjourned for a specified time reasonably sufficient for the execution and return of the commission and in case of execution of foreign commissions is dealt as per section 290 is concerned which says the provisions of section 286 and so much of the section 287 and section 288 as relate to the execution of the commission and its return shall apply in respect of commissions issued by any of the courts judges or magistrate here and after mentioned as the as they apply to commissions issued under section 284 the courts judges and magistrate referred to in sub section 1 are any such court judge or magistrate exercising jurisdiction within an area in india to which this court does not extend as the central government me by notification specified in this behalf uh, and any court judge or magistrate exercising jurisdiction in any such country or place outside in india as the central government me by notification specified in this behalf and having authority under the law in force in that country or place to issue commissions for the examination of witnesses in the relation to crimi criminal matter so as far as the evidence on behalf of the prosecution is concerned the this is we have dealt as far as commissions are concerned where, which is dealt right from section 200 and 84 up to section 2 uh, 284 up to section 290 of the criminal procedure code with this now once i mean evidence on behalf of the prosecution starts section 309 of the criminal procedure code is to be read and it says power to postpone or adjourn proceedings in every inquiry or trial the proceedings shall be held as expeditiously as possible and in particular when the examination of a witness has once begun the same shall be continued from day to day until all the witnesses in attendance have been examined unless the court finds that judgment of same beyond the following day to be necessary for reasons to be recorded provided that when the inquiry or trial relates to an offense under section 378 to 376d of the indian penal code the inquiry or the trial 
shall as far as possible be completed within a period of two months from the date of the commencement of the examination of the witnesses. If the court after taking cognizance of an offence or commencement of a trial finds it necessary or advisable to postpone the commencement of or adjourn any inquiry or trial it may from time to time for reasons to be recorded postpone or adjourn the same on such terms as it thinks fit for such time as it considers reasonable and may by a warrant remand the accused if he is in custody provided that no magistrate shall remand an accused person to custody under this section for a term exceeding 15 days at a time provided further that when witnesses are in attendance no adjournment or postponement shall be granted without examining them except for special reasons to be recorded in writing provided also that no adjournment shall be granted for the purpose only of enabling the accused person to show cause against the sentence proposed to be imposed on him provided also that no adjournment shall be granted at the request of a party except where the circumstances are beyond the control of that party. The fact that the pleader of the party is engaged in another court shall not be a ground for adjournment. Where a witness is present in a court but a party or his pleader is not present or any party or his pleader through Though present in a court is not ready to examine or cross-examine the witness, the court may, if things fit, record the statement of witness and pass such order as it thinks fit dispensing with the examination in chief or cross-examination of the witnesses as the case may be. And the explanation to the section says, if sufficient evidence has been obtained to raise a suspicion, that accused may have committed an offence and it appears likely that further evidence may be obtained by a remand. This is a reasonable cause for a remand. And the second, exp second explanation says the terms on which an adjournment or postponement may be granted include in appropriate cases the payment of cost by the prosecution or, 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 the, or the accused. So this is as far as the one same in court starts recording of the evidence. How it is to be recorded is made very clear as far as section 209 is concerned. With this now, the court conducting a trial has got power to carry out local inspection and that is made very clear as far as section 310 is concerned. It says any judge or magistrate may at any stage of any inquiry, trial or other proceeding after due notice to the parties visit and inspect any place in which an offence is alleged to have been committed or any other place which it is in his opinion necessary to view for the purpose of properly appreciating the evidence given at such inquiry or trial and shall without unnecessarily delay record a memorandum of any relevant facts observed at such inspection. Such memorandum shall form part of the record of the case and if the prosecutor, complainant or accused or any other party to the case so desires, a copy of the memorandum shall be furnished to him free of cost. This is as far as the local inspection is concerned as dealt by section 310 of the uh, criminal procedure code. With this now, when the evidence on behalf of the prosecution is over, the next section, namely section 3, 232 says, if after taking the evidence for the prosecution, examining the accused, and hearing the prosecution and the defense on point, the judge considers that 
there is no evidence that the accused committed the offence, he shall record an order of acquittal. So after evidence on behalf of the prosecution is over, the judge shall examine the accused person and he shall hear the prosecution and the defence. Now this is the time that it is a must for us to refer to section 313 of the Criminal Procedure Code which says power to examine the accused. And it says in every inquiry or trial for the purpose of enabling the accused personally to explain any circumstances appearing in the evidence against him, the court may, subclass small a says may, at any stage without previously warning the accused put such questions to him as the court considers necessary. And this we have dealt with at the time when we started before framing of the charge the procedure that is required to be followed by the court of law or before the court has taken this, this passed an order of discharge what are the steps that are required to be taken by the court during the course of trial. Whereas when we refer to section 313.1 small b it says shall after the witnesses for the prosecution have been examined and before he is called on for his defence question him generally on the case. So court shall go after the witnesses for the prosecution have been examined and before he is called on for his defence question him generally on the case provided that in a summons case where the court has dispensed with the personal attendance of the accused, it may also dispense with his examination under clause B. Sub clause 2 says no oath shall be administered to the accused when he is examined under subsection 1. Sub clause 3 says the accused shall not render himself liable to punishment by refusing to answer such questions or be, by giving false answers to them. Clause 4, sub clause 4 says the answers given by the accused may be taken into consideration in such inquiry or trial and put in evidence for or against him any other inquiry into or trial for any other offence with such answer may tend to show he has committed. Clause 5 says the court may take help of prosecutor and defence counsel in preparing the relevant questions which are to be put to the accused and the court may permit filling of written statement by the accused as sufficient compliance of this section. Now this is after evidence on behalf of the prosecution, if prosecution is over, the steps that are required to be taken as per the, that is examination of an accused is by the, by the court accordingly. But now along with this it is also necessary as I had told you at the time of recording judicial confession the section that comes into a, how to keep the record is dealt as far as section 281 is concerned and it says record of examination of accused. It says whenever the accused is examined by a metropolitan magistrate, the magistrate shall make a memorandum of the substance of the examination of the accused in the language of the court and such memorandum shall be signed by the magistrate and shall form part of the record. Whenever the accused is examined by magistrate other than metropolitan magistrate, and here we are dealing with a trial before a court of session, so this is applicable, or by a court of session, the whole of such examination including every question put to him and every answer given by him shall be recorded in full by the presiding judge or magistrate himself or where he is unable to do so owing to physical or other incapacity under his direction and superintendence by an officer of the court appointed by him in this behalf. Clause 3 says the record shall be practicable in the language in which the accused is examined or if it is that is not practicable in the language of the court. Clause 4 says 
the record shall be shown or read to the accused or if he does not understand the language in which it is written shall be interpreted to him in a language which he understa understands and he shall be at liberty to explain or add to his answers. Clause 5 says, It shall thereafter be signed by the accused and by the magistrate or presiding judge who shall certify under his own hand that the examination was taken in his presence and hearing and that the record contains a full and true account of the statements made by the accused. Whereas Clause 6 says, Nothing in this section shall be deemed to apply to the examination of the accused person in the course of a summary trial. So this is as I told you, the sections to which we are referring to are the common section irrespective of the nature, irrespective of the nature of the trial or in the sense that whenever we are dealing with a trial, the trial before a court of session is dealt right from section 225 to 237. But simultaneously, it is also necessary for us to take into consideration the sections to which we are dealing, which may, which uh, we, we may not repeat at the time of dealing with rest of the trials. So now, coming back to section 232, it says, if after taking the evidence for the prosecution, the exam examining the accused and hearing, hearing the prosecution and the defense on the point, the judge considers that there is no evidence that the accused committed the offence, the judge shall record an order of acquittal. And hence, this is the time, along with this now, judge shall hear, we have uh, understood that judge shall hear the prosecution and the defence, this is the time for us to refer, refer to section 314 of the Criminal Procedure Code, which says, oral arguments and memorandum of arguments. Any party to a proceeding may, as soon as may be, after the close of his evidence, address concise oral arguments and may, before he concludes the oral arguments, if any, submit a memorandum to the court setting forth concisely and under distinct headings the arguments in support of his case and every such memorandum shall form part of the record. A copy of every such memorandum shall be simultaneously furnished to the opposite party. Clause 3 says, No adjournment of proceedings shall be granted for the purpose of filling, for, for the purpose of filing the written argument unless the court for reasons to be recorded in writing considers it necessary to grant such adjournment. And lastly, it says the court may, if it is of the opinion that the oral, oral arguments are not concise or relevant, uh, regulate such arguments. That is as far as section 314, which deals with oral arguments and memorandum of arguments, which is uh, applicable at any time as far as the, as far as the uh, say court will hear the parties is concerned. With this, if the order is that of an acquittal, then that is the end of the trial. Otherwise, the next section that comes into if the court the order is not that of an acquittal, that the but then court wants to proceed further. Section 233 says entering upon the defense. And it says where the accused is not acquitted under section 232, he shall be called upon to enter on his defense and adduce, adduce any evidence he may have in support thereof. If the accused puts in any written statement, the judge shall fight it with the record. If the accused applies for issue of any process for compelling the attendance of any witness or production of any document or thing, the judge shall issue such process unless he considers for reasons to be recorded that such application should be refused on the ground that it is made for the purpose of vexation or delay or for defeating the ends of the justice. So now this is we are dealing with entering upon defence, evidence on behalf of the defence as far as section 233 is concerned with which we shall continue 
in our lecture series as far as the next part of the lecture is concerned.